Okay, I'm going to uh, try to explain non somatic pain and a little bit indirectly uh, suffering um, within kind of that context. And, and keep in mind that suffering is different than pain, suffering is being trapped in uh, a, a state of chronic threat and subsequently the development of chronic disease and disability uh, associated with uh, pain. Um, and also keep in mind uh, that pain is um, a systemic kind of experience, that um, pain has connotations of nociception in some cases, uh, which is stimulating a, a peripheral uh, pain receptors and that being transmitted to the brain. Uh, but pain is also an emotional experience. They're not entirely um, uh, uh, separate processes. They, they run together within the context of our overall systemic physiology. Okay, so we're gonna start here with what we most typically think of in when we're talking about pain. And as I said, that would be like stepping on a tack and stimulating uh, our pain receptors uh, in the peripheral part of our body, stimulating those nociceptors, so to speak. And, uh, and typical things that we think of are, are pain, but also temperature, uh, itching, and, and deep pressure can all be pretty uncomfortable for us and if we think about where that tends to come from you know it, it's from our body from our extremities our head uh, you know our our uh, our face and when we stimulate those receptors um, the signal goes up the peripheral nerve and into the spinal cord and goes up the spinothalamic tracts so it's going to course up the spinal cord um, through this uh, long brain stem here, medulla, pons, midbrain, right? And it's going to get to the thalamus, spinal thalamic. Our thalamus is a major relay station for uh, sensations. And from the thalamus, it's going to have uh, effect and, and be dispersed, routed to different parts of our brain. But most significantly, it then goes up to our somatosensory cortex, which lies in the anterior part of the parietal lobe, um, you know, really just behind the middle of the top of the brain. And this form of pain, this spinal thalamic pain coming up uh, from the body is, um, can be, you know, pretty acute. It, it, it can have very distinct qualities to it. You know, it can be uh, sharp. It can be uh, more of a dull ache. Uh, it can, as we said, it can be uh, hot and burny, uh, unpleasant uh, tingling, kind of deep uh, pressure, or even, you know, if we're having um, some form of allergic response to it, uh, kind of uncomfortable itching. And it tends to be pretty precise. We can say, yeah, that's my big toe, right? It's not vague. Uh, it can refer at times, but in general, it's pretty precise in its location, um, which we'll come back to, to, to that uh, a little bit later on. So again, bottom up input coming into the brain, registering up here in the cortex of the brain. And when it gets here, those are our somatosensory feelings. We feel them when that, that signal reaches the, the cortex of the brain, we have a, a feeling, okay? And in this case, we're talking about pain. Um, now, let's also go to the level of the brain stem, okay? And we have uh, a similar input coming from the fifth cranial nerve here that um, is going to take similar inputs, and again, we think of the fifth cranial nerves in, in terms of also trigeminal neuralgia, a nerve pain in, in, in uh, the distribution of the face. And we also know that trigeminal ganglion blocks are used for trying to 
tone down uh, headaches, um, migraine uh, type headaches in, in particular. So up above the level of the spinal cord, the um, fifth cranial nerve, right? It is sort of a representation of this spinal thalamic system that goes down to the rest of the body. So it's going to come in here, go to the thalamus, and again, we're going to get in the sensory homunculus, the somatosensory homunculus of the brain, we're going to get a really precise representation of that pain. So again, from below to the cortex, this flow of information coming from the external environment and how it's affecting us. What else do we have going on in the brainstem? Well, we have our other cranial nerves, right? Smell, sight, uh, hearing, and taste. Um, and uh, those also take in information from the external environment and, uh, and, and have inputs into the system that may not be specifically pain, but you know, if something smells terrible, right, uh, uh, that's gonna register as aversive or unpleasant. If like lights are too bright, might burn out our retina, we're looking at an eclipse, right? That's gonna register as, uh, as a threat and be uncomfortable. Um, if sounds are too loud, perhaps would damage our, our eardrums, that's also gonna register as being uncomfortable. If something tastes bad, is disgusting, that's gonna register as, as a threat, potential threat, a warning. We're gonna stay away from that, okay? So just like all of these you know, cranial nerve senses are looking for danger in the environment and trying to protect us from, uh, from being injured or getting sick um, through the the fifth cranial nerve and these spinal thalamic tracts, pain is a signal to keep us safe, okay? It's not a chronic disease in and of itself. And we shouldn't conflate the two. We shouldn't make pain a, a, a diagnosis. Pain should not necessarily be a, a, a kind of a sense of a, a, a specialty of disease in medicine, we need to look at pain as what it's trying to tell us, what it's signaling to us. And it is, you know, there's there's potential danger, a real danger out there, and it's there to protect us. If we didn't have these things that could sense danger in our environment, we would go from organic to inorganic really quickly. We would die, we would not exist. In fact, life would not uh, exist kind of as we know it without being able to without being able to sense danger in our environment. Okay, so keep that in mind from below coming up. I wanna hit something else here though, the 10th cranial nerve, okay? This is the vagus nerve that comes into the nucleus tractus solitarius, the nucleus ambiguous and the dorsal motor nucleus uh, is where these, uh, this automatic part of our nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, uh, part of the parasympathetic nervous system comes uh, from below, so the dorsal vagal nerve from below the diaphragm, unmyelinated, a little slower, the ventral vagal nerve above the diaphragm, a little quicker in, in giving feedback um, that we're getting information essentially from our guts, right? And we have uh, parasympathetics down in the sacral region too that do something similar. But this is a big nerve, the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve, that gives a massive amount of feedback up into the brain stem level and eventually getting up higher into the brain from our, our system below. Different though than the somatosensory feedback, right? This one is giving information about our guts, about our viscera and our fascia and its status, okay? So keep that in mind as we move forward, it's, it's a little bit different. And I wanna point out that these visceral fascial feelings, sort of our gut feelings, they don't go up to this somatosensory uh, cortical strip that are, that, um, that our som uh, somatic sensations go to, okay? They go to a more primitive level in the brain below that, 
and are primarily registering in the anterior to mid cingulate cortex and into the insular cortex, okay? So the insular cortex is very deep in the brain, insulated. Uh, it's tucked up into the brain, kind of around the stem, up, up like that. It's actually newer than the cingulate cortex, but older than, for example, the free front, prefrontal uh, cortex. But this is where our, um, our, our, uh, our gut feelings are, where our vis visceral feelings our fascial feelings uh, register a little deeper in the brain here, okay? All right, so now we have this full flow bottom up, right? Some of it going up to the uh, somatosensory strip, uh, but the gut stuff going into, into the cingulate and insular cortex lower down deeper in the brain, okay? Um, now, what about talking about top down? What are we usually talking about there? Okay, so when we talk about top down input, you know, uh, uh, where does that go? We're typically talking about pain that is not physical. It's not coming from the external environment. It's not coming from what I call the exterosome. It's, it's coming more internally. It, it's something that, that we're actually generating ourselves. It's coming from the enterosome, okay? And so let's, let's, let's talk about what this actually kind of means in a, in, a, in a human being. And first off, I want to do, again, a little review of some of the anatomy and how uh, what we would call the neocortex or the newer cortex of the brain, kind of the mammalian cortex of the brain, and perhaps more specifically the sapiocortex of the brain, meaning homo sapien neocortex, because it's really unique compared to other species. Sapio meaning wise, debatable, but, but in general, you know, the idea that we have something special going on in, in the human neocortex or the homo sapien neocortex. Okay, so let's, let's actually go over here first. So the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is where our working memory is. It's where we make cognitive constructs, where we can figure out how to make, um, you, know, you know, rockets or uh, telescopes, things like that. It's pretty complex stuff. It's also where our executive functions are. So that's the rational thought, reasoning, planning, strategizing, where judgment exists, where we are contemplative, that type of stuff. And you, you could say to the front, but in the human brain, it's actually a little bit below because the brain sort of tips forward. The ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, this is where you know thoughts kind of bubble up through our physiology and, and come up and they, you know, we have ideations and imaginations and we create narratives. Um, and it's also the, uh, the uh, expressive center for language, which is symbolic uh, communication, is in this uh, ventral lateral prefrontal cortical area, possibly kind of like a Broca's area that you, you might think about there. Um, so keep, keep this in mind. It's, Part of the uniqueness of our brains that we can, uh, you know, really create uh, uh, ideas and imagine things, but in certain situations, you know, sometimes create bad ideas. Uh, and we talked a little bit already about the insular cortex, which again is older than this, folded up underneath, but this is where visceral feelings come up, fascial feelings come up, emotional feelings come up. Okay, our gut feelings, right, come up through there, and there's a, a vague sense of, of, of self in there, and we can also kind of, with our sense of self, we can house some beliefs down deep in there. So with, with that comment, I always like to say that when, if you think of uh, uh, visceral pain, right, on one track, put emotional pain on another track, parallel tracks, railroad tracks, put a middle rail and connect the two through a middle rail. It's impossible to have visceral pain without emotional pain. It's impossible to have emotional pain without visceral pain. They run 
hand in hand, and it makes some sense that our emo emotional and visceral feelings, when they, when these, this physiology gets to our cortex, right, and they become feelings, that they tend to co coexist in the uh, insular cortex and the singular cortex, right? So our gut feelings of emotional pain and visceral pain reside very closely together. They're tethered together. So that, that's kind of an important concept. Okay, now, uh, maybe more relevant to this idea of non-somatic pain is uh, the medial uh, prefrontal cortex. And I always find something here. So let's go, yeah, we got it, never mind. We got medial prefrontal cortex. So the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is involved in a, avoiding pain, physical, emotional, social, even financial. It's designed to help us avoid pain. It's uh, in, involved in conflict detection and resolution, okay? It's, uh, it's involved in initial responses, new responses. New information comes in, we have to create a new response. And it's very sensitive to the external inputs, okay? We talked a little bit about that just a second ago. Um, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is involved in approach behavior, okay? Sociality, but also aggression, okay? Um, it's involved in reward, in, in, in seeking and pleasure, but also in repeating activities because they were rewarding, right? Uh, it's, it has a role in active avoidance, okay? And here's where the learned responses tend to reside, particularly around things like social situations, whereas new responses were up here. And it's very sensitive to that, to our internal environment, to the, to, uh, to not so much the, the, all this input that was coming bottom up, but all this input that's sort of coming uh, from, the, from the top down. And then let's, uh, we've already talked a little bit about the cingulate cortex, this strip right here, right, below uh, the neocortical functions, uh, the prefrontal cortex. Um, so the cingulate cortex involved in decision making, conflict registers here, something's not right, conflict registers here, error registers, oh my god, I did something wrong. And then it speaks directly to the limbic system and everything to to kind of create a, 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 a threat response in us, okay? And that's more anterior. In the middle is where we see sort of um, social, uh, the, the social context of things, social feelings, emotional feelings. Um, and we already talked about um, uh, that the vis visceral gut feelings exist with the emotional feelings. Um, and in the posterior aspect of it, so way back here, as in the insular cortex, is where kind of a vague sense of self exists. Whatever, whatever that is, it's not the self, but it's a sense of who we are kind of in the moment exists uh, in the posterior aspect of that. Um, this posterior, there's something called the default mode network when you're thinking about yourself. You're kind of, everything's gone internal and this area is involved um, as is the medial prefrontal cortex. They're both kind of involved in that, as is a part of the parietal cortex, as is the posterior aqueductal gray. Um, but anyway, well, that's for another day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the, the interaction that uh, happens uh, from below and from above within uh, the context of some of the stuff we were talking about. I should say one more comment on the on the uh, the sapio cortex, the, the Homo sapiens, the distinctly human neocortex. We have this very unique ability um, to take uh, information, right, and and thoughts that bubble up, kind of pop in, and like you know, like soap bubbles into our brain, and take them and sort of play with them, or. Sometimes, uh, you know, they may be biased in terms of threat, but, you know, to create uh, an ideation around them and then take that ideation, you know, and it can, it can go from here up to here where it can become kind of a formal construct, you know, where we try to attach meaning and create 
uh, something out of a, a thought goes to an ideation, goes to uh, a created construct. And then with that construct, we'll take and kind of shove it back down through, you know, through, through here and shove it into our, our um, declarative memory banks, our, our uh, deep, deep, deep in the brain here, the medial temporal lobes. Uh, we'll store factual information and that kind of stuff. But maybe more importantly is where we create narratives around it in, in our language, in our symbolic communication system. And, and, and so the, the narrative, you know, we share with other people, but we also tell ourselves this, this narrative over and over again. And eventually, whether it's based on fact or fiction, doesn't really matter, you know, it will get housed within our brain. And, uh, and it kind of becomes our belief system uh, housed in, uh, in the deeper uh, and older structures of the brain, kind of beliefs get housed a little bit below rational thought of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in this area where we also store our gut uh, feelings and our sense of self, okay? So we're able to, with this information coming through that's really unique to what we do, and how we can uh, make things symbolic, uh, make uh, uh, these complex uh, con you know, constructs um, and stories, and then eventually evolving into kind of a, a belief systems. We just, we know, we don't have any real reason to know, but we just feel like we, we, know, we know something and we're willing to you know, share it with everybody. Okay, so back to um, bottom up versus top down. Okay, so as the signaling and the physiology bubbles up from the bottom through the brain stem, right, it hits the midbrain here. So top of the brain stem, um, you know, just below the thalamus, but uh, um, uh, above the, the pons, uh, where uh, a lot of other than, you know, kind of uh, the couple cranial nerves where we have a massive amount of information coming in. And it, and it, it comes in, into this, this area, um, which is the periactal ductal gray, this little speckled square part in the back part of the midbrain, um, is where this uh, physiology comes through. And it is like the spinal thalamic's pain signaling is modified. Uh, and it can be, you know, it can be coming from the vagus nerve too, right? Uh, or the spinal thalamic's. It gets modulated, the signal going both up and down through uh, by the periactal ductal gray cells. They're able to mod modulate pain. And we know when we're in threat, our sensory system uh, becomes more acute. So pain also becomes more acute when we're under threat, uh, whether it be uh, a physical threat or emotional or social or even financial threat, that signal is going to be amplified coming through uh, this area, okay? So, and I should point out that the periactal gray sits in a kind of a unique position where in front of it, to the ventral side, you have the, the tegmentum, the ventral tegmentum, full of dopamine, substantia nigra, full of dopamine, a feel-good neurotransmitter designed to uh, get us to move from motion, movement, uh, and and, and uh, also motivation, okay? And it affects our emotions as well, right? Dopamine does feel good with that. And then below it, kind of this sequence of nuclei, that the raphine nuclei where serotonin is produced here um, it, that influences uh, sort of the, the cells in the periapical ductal gray, which influence uh, modulate our pain signaling. And, and kind of right here towards the front a little bit more in the pons is the locus surrealis where norepinephrine or noradrenaline we sometimes call it, uh, so it um, uh, exists. So that noradrenaline really serves to kind of activate us, right? Um, whereas dopamine is also activating and stimulates kind of approach behavior and motivation. Um, but uh, nor norepinephrine is a little bit more involved in, uh, in, in kind of juicing up our, our system, whether it's for fight or, or flight, okay? So the periaqueductal gray is modifying all these signals coming actually both top down and bottom up, but for the most part here, we're talking about bottom up, 
modifying the amplitude of these signals that are eventually going to get up into the limbic structures like the, uh, like the amygdala and then eventually get up to our older cortical structures and then our newer cortical structures. And we should also note that in here, there are also receptors for things like oxytocin and vasopressin. Uh, and there are receptors for our endocannabinoids and our endoopioids that um, participate in kind of this uh, modulation of not just pain, but uh, uh, emotional and, and behavioral and even cognitive responses can be modified here. So in the periaqueductal gray, we can state that this is where raw emotions exist, okay? This is where uh, you get very raw emotions and left unfiltered, we would end up with very raw feelings and we would end up with very raw thoughts and very raw behaviors potentially uh, from this level of kind of the primitive, the primitive brain. Okay, so our body is sensing uh, pain. It's sensing a threat. It's coming up from below and it wants to kind of flow through, it flows up through the uh, striatal network from the midbrain. These tracks flow upward and prior to reaching kind of this prefrontal cortical area, you know, sort of, I always like to think of it as the tip of the nucleus accumbens, the tip of the striatum. Um, and sometimes these impulses come raging through, right? We, we get pissed off and we are now out of our minds, right? Uh, we are doing stuff before the prefrontal cortex, the sapiocortex has any say. We're already in, in, in action, right? That, that can come through. But other times, this, particularly the medial prefrontal cortex here, says, whoa, no, don't do that. Don't show them that you're sad or you're hurt or you're embarrassed or don't act up, don't punch them in the nose, you know, or even, no, you know, don't think that thought. You would not be a good person if you're thinking that thought. So all of these ideations, constructs, narratives, and beliefs that we talked about earlier are having an impact coming back down uh, to determine our, our trying to control our emotions, control our thoughts, and control our behaviors, okay? So, um, and a lot of the stuff that comes back down is, you know, I need to, I should, I have to, I must, uh, uh, you know, those type of things that, that we're taught, right? What's the saying? Uh, um, I forgot who I was before the world told me who I needed to be. So a lot of that stuff's coming down. So you have our sort of our needs and drives, right? Our emotions do this as well, our behaviors and, and, and our thoughts coming from all this signaling below that might be, you know, telling us we need to do something, we need to move, right? We need to emote. And then we get this information coming back going, no, don't, don't. You know, they'll think you're stupid. They'll, you'll embarrass yourself, whatever. So we create this, this tension. It's not really a tug of war. It's more like, you know, butting heads, right? And the medial prefrontal cortex is really good at inhibiting this nat sort of natural physiologic flow that you might see in, 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 in animals or, or mammals or even, you know, lower uh, level animals inhibit that. And when, and when our needs and desires are in conflict with our, our, our need, need to's and have to's, right? Our drives and desires are in conflict with um, what it means to be a, a, a good, normal, um, pro-social, uh, human being and the culture that we exist in, when they get in, 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 into butting their heads together, um, this will register in the anterior cingulate cortex as, as a conflict, and I might make a mistake, or there's an error here, and we've got decisions to make. But what this does is the anterior cingulate cortex is going to then activate the, the amygdala, the limbic system, to put us on, on to kind of a threat response, into threat physiology, sort of our inflammatory uh, physiology, also has metabolic changes involved. 
when we're in a threat response, and it's also catabolic, meaning we degenerate our tissues in that physiologic state. So that's something that we have to recognize that repressing our emotions, suppressing our thoughts, and constraining our behavior can come with a physiologic cost to us. It can put us in a threat response. There may be a sociologic need or a cultural need uh, to do that, right? To belong, to, to belong in society or belong with our friends or even belong in our cult or in our culture, right? Uh, but there can be a, a, a physiologic cost if those emotions, thoughts, and behaviors are not expressed appropriately and constructively and then integrated into our greater being. Because the threat physiology is going to continue to run throughout us, but it tends to run out of our awareness. It's been inhibited from getting through to our cortex by uh, this, uh, this dynamic of repression, suppression, and constraint. That's the way the medial prefrontal cortex can inhibit us, right? And, and we talk about this in terms of mature brain, right? That, uh, you know, a three-year-old, nah, I don't, this is not developed yet, right? So all this stuff comes through. Even in adolescence, you know, we kind of go, now their prefrontal cortex isn't developed, we should expect this kind of behavior. And we talk about how this prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed till we're 25, maybe a little earlier in females than males and all that kind of stuff. But there's a cost to this development, right? There's a cost to telling people who they have to be, who they must be. And so what ends up happening here is if the emotions, you know, the behaviors, the, the thoughts are not allowed any real natural physiologic flow, if we never really deal with them or address them, we get this physiology going below. And this tends then to be particularly expressed back into our tissues, right? Where we start seeing inflammation, amplified pain signaling, catabolism, degeneration of, uh, of those, those tissues, significant metabolic changes, um, you know, can precipitate things like obesity and hypothyroidism and all that kind of stuff too. Okay, so I think one of the things that we have to understand is that that type of pain, that type of um, achy, doesn't general, or I'm sorry, generalizes, it doesn't localize well, can be a little non-specific, tends to refer to other places, tend to wander around the body, right? I've got stiff neck and shoulders some days, some days I got a tummy ache, sometimes I'm tight in my chest, some days I've constipated, some days I got irritable bowel, some days I've got, you know, urgency and, you know, or maybe even interstitial cystitis, um, that uh, all of those things, those types of pains are not coming from here. And if you go see a doc who's treating this, who's tr who knows spinal thalamic kind of pain signaling, right, and is trying to treat this, with pills or procedures or in, in implanted stimulators or, or that type of thing, you might get a little placebo effect when you start them, but they're not gonna fix the problem because this is different. This type of, uh, of pain, this type of somatosensory pain is different than socio-emotional, visceral, fascio, uh, pain. They are transmitted differently, they are created differently, they live in the brain differently, and the application uh, uh, of uh, the modalities we use in managing somatosensory pain to uh, socio-visceral 
emotional fascia, whatever you want to call it, all, all that kind of pain are probably doomed uh, to fail. And we see this play out every day. And the fact of the matter, particularly with you know rep repression and suppression, right? When when we compartmentalize this stuff, when we stuff it away, and we aren't really cortically aware of this, right? To know that it, it's there and we need to, to you know to deal with it uh, in, in a proper fashion, we get stuck. And I talked a little bit about you know when when you get pissed off, right, and everything gets amplified, and you go out of your mind. You, you, you don't have good access to like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex for rational thought, you're impulsive, reactive, and aggressive, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Make some bad mistakes, kind of damage relationships sometimes. We can be out of our minds, but we can also get stuck in our minds. So the other thing is, the other half of the threat equation, and we got fight and flight, right? and we can be out of our minds in fight and flight, we don't have rational thought there. It's biologic, right? It's adaptive, it's important for survival. Um, we can also, in the deeper state of threat, uh, we can fall into what I call falter or faint physiology, and that's where we get stuck in our minds, right? We run these circuits, right? an idea, a construct, a narrative that we tell over and over, a, a belief that's not based on any form of fact that we just know is absolutely true. And we run those cycles over and over again, right? And so those are, you know, we're, we're, we're not any brighter in those states, right? We're, we're, we are, we tend to be um, obsessive. We tend to ruminate. You'll, you'll see um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders there. We see people become asocial and withdrawn, depressed, and fall into kind of the pit of despair in those states. So in neither state are we kind of fully conscious, right? One state we're out of our minds, the other state we're stuck in our mind. We're grinding this circuit. And you see that with the dorsal, uh, I'm sorry, not the dorsal, but the uh, default mode network. We got two DMNs going. The default mode network where when we're in threat, that thing grinds and, and we become very internalized, right? Um, we, this part of the brain, the focus on the self lights up in that situation. Um, the medial prefrontal cortex is inhibiting, 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 right? We get some conflict registering here, the flow isn't coming through, and now we're stuck in our mind ruminating about ourselves. We can't get out of that space. Um, and, and in the same process, our body is mildly inflamed, strongly catabolic, our immune system is not working well, we're depressed, our immune cells are depressed, you know, we're pretty sickly. We get from kind of hopeless to helpless pretty rapidly in chronic threat states and we don't feel good, you know. So now we're talking about the chronic fatigue syndromes and the post-COVID syndromes and that kind of thing that all the way this goes all the way down you know into our cells and our mitochondria um, now when we are stuck in our minds right when we're grinding these uh, neocortical functions right when we're and by the way the neocortical the sapiocortical functions are distinctly not helpful uh, in a tiger attack, right? It, there's there's no point in being cr creative uh, to invent new stuff, invent new con, uh, constructs in a tiger attack. Uh, symbolic language is meaningless. You know, you can't tell the tiger a story or a lie. He doesn't care. Um, declarative memory, you know, housed in the medial temporal lobes. Declarative me factual memory, jeopardy, right? The tiger doesn't play jeopardy. So none of that stuff is important when we're under threat in a tiger attack, right? And the fact of the matter is the body consumes 20, or sorry, the brain consumes 20 to 30% of the energy of the entire system and the entire body. And, uh, and of that energy, the neocortical functions can consume uh, about 80% 
of that total uh, 20 to 30 percent of the energy that, that the brains generate. So that energy can be used better elsewhere in a tiger attack. So not only are we grinding these circuits, but there is uh, a physiologic response to turn off neocortical functions, okay? And so you can see that pattern kind of play out over and over again. Eventually, in deep, long, severe threat, you'll also see these older cortical functions start to downregulate. This kind of pattern we can see in depression, right? We can see it uh, in Alzheimer's or most dementias. We see it in schizophrenia, but it's also a, a similar pattern uh, that we might even see in, in, you know, in, in autism as well. Okay, so just kind of pull it together. We've got bottom-up flow, right? It's telling us what's dangerous out there in the world, what we need to avoid. It wants to get to the cortex to make us aware that we're in danger. Um, we've got top-down flow or inhibition, right? That's coming from the distinctly human homo sapien neocortex, the sapiocortex, that's giving input back in. You might be in social danger um, or uh, an ideologic danger, something like that, feeding back into the system to activate a threat response. Uh, and then we also have the neocortical function saying, ah, you know, socially that's not acceptable and inhibiting the natural flow from below, which creates uh, even uh, creates conflict and an even more amplified threat response in the body if we never let that flow come through, if we never express our emotions, if we never express our thoughts, if we keep our behavior constrained all the time, right? We curl up in a ball of despair over time. And we're going to have a tremendous amount of non-somatic pain and suffering. Right? It's not going to be this stuff. It's going to be this some social, emotional, visceral, fascial, these sort of gut feelings uh, where nothing quite seems right. So I hope that gives a decent explanation of how we work.